Okay, sounds well, good. Welcome back to the Ohio Business Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Pohl. I am joined today with our wonderful guest, John Templeman, also known as Charlie of JIB uh, Records, Machine Records, my bad. Um, thanks for coming on, first off. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Stephen. Kind of a, give us a background on yourself first, and we can then go into JIB. Okay. Um, I've uh, lived in Cleveland <clears throat> for the past 20 plus years. I'm originally from, grew up in Ohio. I'm originally from the Youngstown area, Girard, Ohio. Um, went to Bowling Green for undergrad and came to Cleveland afterwards. Um, I've been working in higher education for the last 20 plus years in, in annual giving fundraising. Uh, in addition to uh, my whole second life, which is the music thing, um, not only running Jib Machine, which I've uh, now been operating for the past 17 years, but also, um, you know, various music projects, whether my own or producing other people or promoting other people or um, whatever it may be. Um, like I said, lived in Cleveland for the last 20 plus years, last 15 in the warehouse district here, which is where I, I currently reside downtown. So um, it's been, uh, it's been fun. Now, how big of an influence was uh, the Cleveland rock and roll scene on, on just your upbringing and where you are today? The Cleveland scene, not very big. Um, like I said, I grew up in Youngstown. Uh, oh, my, yeah. par my parents were actually in a band together. Um, okay. So I was kind of uh, in that world when they were in bands, which was like the late seventies into probably the mid eighties. Um, so that's where a lot of the influence came. Uh, but I was always heavily influenced by rock. Um, I had older aunts and uncles that were very much into rock music. And that's how I was exposed to bands like Queen, Kiss, Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, um, you know, and that sort of, that sort of thing. So it's just part of rock. I think it's just part of my DNA. It's, uh, it's always been there. Um, and it's just something I've been doing since I was a kid, really. Mm -hmm. So it was just very natural to come into this position at JIB. J yeah. Yeah. Jib was very, I actually started the label. Um, I had a couple bands that, that didn't work out. And when the, the uh, one band, it was called the J pyramid kind of abruptly ended for various reasons. Um, kind of took some time off and then went back to basics. I had a friend that was a, an audio engineer that was in New York City at the time. I went to New York and recorded a demo in his bedroom. Um, and that was like the first official release on Jib Machine. And then from there, uh, I had some heavier songs uh, that weren't acoustic based and started jamming with a friend of mine, Robbie Mitchell. And we ended up starting a band called Hot Ham and Cheese. Um, our bass player, Louis, Louis Sticks joined us a few months after we started it. And then the three of us were together for 14 years, um, released a number of albums and toured all over the place. Um, we decided in 2019, we had taken it as far as we were going to take it. We played our last show in November and we're going on an indefinite hiatus and then COVID hit. So it, we kind of he took care of it before COVID. Yeah, <laughs> tie, 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 tied yeah. everything up in a nice little bow and then and then that happened so we wouldn't have been able to play shows or anything anyway this year but or last year i should say but uh yeah it, it was um and that's kind of how it got started and then from that band playing out we started meeting other bands and they were like hey can we be on your label and then that's really kind of how everything got got rolling and you you said the the label got created 18 years ago around that time 17, 2004, I started conceptualizing it and planning for it. And then our, our first website went live on January 1st, 20, 2005. January so 2005. it really started because you needed a label and then other artists were coming to you to ask to be on your label as well? Well, I, I started it, honestly, to, to distribute my stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, do have a, I do have degrees and a background in marketing. Um, and so I you know, decided to just you know, screw these other things, screw, screw being in a band and this and that, and I'm just going to do it myself. And then from there, things just naturally happened. You know, how sometimes that it works out that way. You put yourself out there, take some risks and you never know things just kind of go a certain way from there. Yeah. You kind of label yourself as something and then as maybe a label and then, you know, people flock to you or artists flock to you if you do it long enough. So that's, that's awesome. Um, well, as a musician yourself, 
Um, do you still create music? Do you help you, you help produce and you also do the marketing? Kind of explain your role at uh, Jim. Yeah. So um, I guess yes to all those questions. Um, since Hot Ham and Cheese ended, I, I started a, a project that was a side project that's now become more of a main project uh, called Guazi uh, with my good friend Brandon Youngs, who owns a, a recording studio here in town called Track 6 Recording. Um, Brandon and I have been collaborating since 2005. Um, so Guazi, we, I think we did the first Guazi record in 2015 and we've done a number of things since then, um, including like not just making songs to release, but also we started doing custom music for like movies and uh, other people and things like that. Um, so that's a pretty cool collaboration. I also have been doing, uh, I've been working on a solo album for the past year. I started it right before lockdown. Uh, and pretty much worked on it all the past year and just finished the final mix of the last song last week. So that's, that's one thing. Then in terms of running the label, yes, I, I come up with the marketing plan, um, work with the artists on their vision, um, how they want to market their release. We look at budgets, um, the fan base and the now social media presence of the artist makes a difference and influences the plan. I think everybody's a little different. Some I'm a little more active with, others kind of, they do their own thing and I'm just there to help support and get make sure their music gets out there. Um, last year in, in 2020, a very big development in the history of the label happened where um, I signed an agreement, a distribution agreement with a company that's actually based here in Cleveland called CPI Distribution that's been around for a while. And the owner, Clay Pasternick, has been in the music business for many years. And that has helped Jib in terms of it's just having that guidance and experience of, of um, someone that's been doing it for so long. Um, and then the, he manages more of the physical side of the distribution, which is international. So it's domestic and international. And then the, the digital side, he has a manager named Stacy. Um, and she's also been around for a long time uh, in the music business. And that distribution is through uh, the Orchard, which is now, um, I think it's a subsidiary of Sony Music. So having that support has really elevated the label and it's gonna allow us to really assist our artists even more than we have up to this point. Um, so I guess to answer your question, you know, in the short, <laughs> short answer is I do a little bit of everything from an artist on the label to, um, marketing to, um, sometimes we finance certain things, uh, depending on what, what it may entail. Um, and then just doing our best to get it out there to the world and, and, um, you know, execute whatever plan we put together for that specific artist or release. You, you talked about international distribution. How, how key is that for this type of, uh, for this label and just the, the type of music that you put out there? I think it's going to help us in the long run. Um, you know, Europeans are still very much into rock music. As a matter of fact, one of the bands on the label is a European band. Uh, Mouth of Clay is from Sweden. Um, and uh, the main songwriter and performer in Mouth of Clay, Hawken, uh, England and I have become really good friends for the past few years. And um, he's going to start releasing other projects through Jib as well. Um, so, you know, I, I just think there's a strong rock presence still in Europe. They still appreciate it way more than Americans do. Um, you know, rock's kind of a, it's just a blip on the radar here these days. Days. But I mean, in the underground and in certain circles, it's still very strong, but it's just not in the mainstream where I still think it's part of the, the fabric in Europe. Um, so I think for Jib to have long term success, it's it's important for us to branch out there. And as soon as, you know, we're allowed to travel and, and concerts start again, which I'm guessing 2022 has been the target uh, all along. Um, a couple of our bands have already had some opportunities to go. Some have already toured Europe and have had opportunities to go back. Some are looking, like Slam and Gladys is looking to go over there. Mike Onesco has a very a strong following there, and he's about to release a record here in a few months called The Guitar Army. Um, and folks want him to come back next year, uh, some of the, the promoters that he's worked with in the past. So hopefully we can put together some sort of gym machine tour next summer or fall. Um, 2022 <clears throat> kind of 
continue what we've started over there, um, you know, and what we're trying to cultivate over there. Is, is there a more of a demand for a tour in, in the Europe market compared to the United States? I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Especially okay. with, with our, with our artists and the audience and our demographic. I mean, our demographic is, as you can imagine, it's, it's a, it's more an older age range. We're usually between like 35 and 60. Um, probably more male than female. Um, you know, so I, I think, again, I do think there's more opportunities in Europe from a touring standpoint, not to say that our bands won't play in America, play shows in America, of course, that's going to happen. But, um, you know, Europe is definitely uh, a target, you know, and even though the label is based in Cleveland, I, I would say we were very much part of the the fabric of the Cleveland music scene in the early part of the label. So I'm probably like 2005 to maybe 20, I don't know. I'd say we, the label had a really good run from like about 2005 to like 2010. And then we were obviously still a Cleveland based label, but that's when I started to work with <clears throat> bands outside of the city. Um, the last few bands that I've signed are in LA New York, Virginia, Sweden. Um, so I, even though I'm based in Cleveland and it's really super convenient with CPI being, being here too, um, I have greater aspirations. Not, not to just be Cleveland famous, but internationally famous. Yeah. <laughs> internationally known. Because then our artists have the most opportunity and that's really what it comes down to is how many people can we get our music in front of? And that's the goal, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so... Um, even though I'm based in Cleveland, I, I definitely look beyond not just here or the United States, but, you know, internationally. There's, there's a huge market in China now, too. I mean, there's there's all sorts of opportunities, just like yeah. everything. And everything's going global. Yeah, I think I think the pandemic is speeding things up even more because Zoom has made it just as we're talking right now. Zoom has made it completely acceptable to conduct business all over the place sitting in your living room. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it will, that, that benefits uh gym machine, you know, so we'll, we'll see how this pans out. You know? Yeah. It benefits small, small, small uh, business leaders, you know, because they can communicate easier. Uh, it's more, you know, face to face. Like I, before the pandemic, I, it was only phone calls. Now everything is a zoom or, you know, WebEx type thing. So it is interesting how that is an advantage because uh, now, now you can talk to anyone, like you said. Right. And you would have had to, you know, if you wanted to meet with someone, you would have had to fly if you wanted to, you know, really get business done in person. But I, I think this has become obviously an acceptable form because yeah. we have no other choice at this point. And so it took something that I think would have eventually happened in maybe four or five years and just went boom, immediately, yeah. you know, I mean, that. so I think that's, uh, again, there's, there's positives. There's a lot of terrible things that have happened in the last year, but there's a lot of positives you know silver linings that have come out of it too i think this is one of them how how did COVID affect jib and uh i guess your own personal music or just your artists as a whole um well we had some things planned for last year that uh the mouth of clay album was actually scheduled to come out and it was already set in stone when lockdown happened so we moved forward with that release um, and promoted that the best we can, but we pretty much canceled and pushed everything from the second half of the year to this year. Um, not only because of COVID, but it was also because of the deal with, with CPI was signed. And there was a lot of um, legwork that I needed to get done. I needed to move our current catalog over physically and digitally, and that, that took a number of months. Um, and then kind of plan how things were going to look in 2021. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't know. It worked out for us, for sure, uh, in, in that regard. And then this, how did it affect me from an artist standpoint? Um, I think it affect, at least me personally, it affect lyrically um, this new solo record uh, that, I've, that I've done. I, I released my solo material under JTemp13. So uh, this will be another one of those. It, I'm hoping the it'll. I, I have so many things that need to happen from now until like the end of the year, so that my record will probably come out later in the year, like September or October. Um, but 
obviously we were affected by what was going on. I think lyrically, there's a lot of that um, in there and, and living in downtown, I, I kind of saw how the city was affected by this whole thing, uh, including yeah, the, the, the social unrest and, and the riots that took place last summer. Um, and just watching how everything has happened, I think that that's, that definitely uh, found its way lyrically into the album. Um, musically, it's all over the place. It's, uh, I like all different kinds of music. So I, I wanted it, when I set out making it, I wanted it to sound cohesive, but sound like a playlist of different bands, if that makes any sense. So each song has, is unique, but it does okay. their cohesive thread and sound through it. I think I've achieved that. We'll find out. And we'll see what people think of it. I'm going <laughs> to check out your stuff. I'm excited. You're, you're on, I'm, I'm assuming you're on Spotify, right? J10? J10. Yep. Thank you. Okay. I, I'm going to check it out after this. Um, did the music industry as a whole put off, like cancel and put back a lot of records to this year as well? Is that what we're, what, what was happening? Yeah. A lot of people that had big out, especially big artists, um, a lot of them move, if they had stuff already in the queue, they, they moved the release dates back. I noticed. A couple of them went through, but it, it, there was a period there where things were really slow. Um, and a lot of artists, I've read articles, there's a lot of big bands that won't even put anything out until they can tour again. Um, you know, so I just read an article, Avenge Sevenfold was talking about how the album's almost done, but they're not going to put it out till they can tour. I think the Foo Fighters had the same attitude, but they just finally put their record. I think Dave Roll just said, screw it, because their record was ready to come out a year ago. And then they moved it to the first part of this year. But, you know, they still can't tour either. You know, but uh, yeah, I think that's the thing. A lot of the bigger bands really are going to miss opportunities and revenue if they, you know, released an album without touring. Yeah, yeah, that's, it, that's where drop, the money. Yeah, coming. releasing the album and then the momentum of it, and then carrying over into ticket sales, and that's where all the money's at. Merchandise. Okay, interesting. Traveling, t- traveling t-shirt salesman. You know yeah. that what. The music business is, it's, it's very interesting because <clears throat> when I was growing up, like the eighties and nineties, um, it's completely flip-flopped, right? Like back in the day before, before, uh, there was digital downloads and streaming, um, when you could only get physical medium, um, a band would release an album and then tour to promote the record and sell records. Cause that's where the money was coming from. And yeah. touring revenue was nice. It was additional, but you know, Tickets to concerts were cheap. Yeah, they're 30 bucks, 40 bucks, whatever. Um, it's completely flip-flop now. Bands will make an album just to have marketing material, but the real money's being made on tour. That's why tickets are so high because they're not getting that revenue that they were once getting, huh. you know, from selling albums. And that's why t-shirts are 50 bucks and you know, koozies are 15 or whatever the hell they charge. You know what I mean? And so yeah. that that's why that happened because it's it, the model completely streaming and digital completely turned it on its head now the last three years there are three three, two three years there's been a positive growth in the music industry from streaming um i know a lot of people complain that spotify doesn't pay and it's you know the the royalty rates are kind of pathetic but at the same time there's a lot of artists making a living um from streaming and probably more so than than in the old model there's more opportunity nowadays it's harder because there's more people out there. It's easier to make music. It's easier to get music online. So there's more stuff. But if you have a plan and you're smart and your stuff is good and you get it out there to the right person, the right people promoting it, you never know who may give you a shout out and you sell, you know, or have so many streams or whatnot. Um, There's still plenty of opportunity. Uh, You just have, again, put a smart plan together. you to market the type of music that you're making to your demographic and then hopefully have another portion of that plan where you're also trying to get new fans. You know, how do we also make the people that would like this happy, but also try to get some, you know, at least in our case, younger fans, you know, how are we going to get 18, 19, 20 year olds to like gym machines music is just as much as the 45 and 50 year olds do. You know, that's a, that's a challenge. Do you guys have anything in, in the works to kind of, to capture that demographic at all? Are you planning? Is there anything marketing well, wise? I'll tell you what, man, I, I, have, we haven't done it yet. Cause there's 
I got to, there's only so much time in the day, so you got to prioritize, but I think TikTok is. Uh, yes, sir. Is, is, yes, sir. A lot, of, a lot of artists are getting, getting discovered on TikTok and, um, you know, I'm late to the game there, but, uh, it's on our list to try to cultivate. We have some ideas with that, like how to, how to cultivate an audience on TikTok. But that, that is so key. It is crazy how songs would just blow up because of that. And I, I used to back in the, I don't do it anymore, but like, I hate TikTok, but it's a great way to find music. So I would literally just scroll. Like when I was like, I don't know, about to go to sleep, I'd just scroll through it and like wait to find a good music in the background. And I, I would find great songs that I still listen to today. And, you know, I don't know if anybody else does that, but I'm, it is a great way to find music. There were, we read an article recently where, it was a hip hop artist and the hip hop, I can't remember who it was, but his manager was looking at his streaming totals and he noticed that in like a, like a, it was like a three or four day span, his total spiked like by like 10,000 streams a day for just a, just a short period of time. And then when he went back and did the research, some social influencer that does reviews on TikTok mentioned one of his tracks and that's where the spike came from. Just one person, that's why I said, you know, getting your stuff out there and hoping that your plan is good enough that it gets in front of somebody that could actually influence people that will go and stream your music or buy physical products, you know, or t-shirts or whatever it may be. Um, you know, that's, that's huge. And, and a lot of that now is coming from YouTube and spot and, and, uh, um, TikTok. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I did see that this, I don't know if this is true, but I, I, I read it, so I feel like it was true. Um, I saw that the, some of the big labels were paying uh, the big top TikTokers to promote their songs uh, right. that they wanted to push. And then yeah. it makes a lot of sense. It's, but, become like, uh, it's almost like the new um, radio, yeah. so, so to speak. You know I mean? It's, it's kind of like the old payola business model, right? Yeah. Like you... You pay a DJ to spin your tracks. Well, now you, know, you pay an influencer on yeah. TikTok to, me to mention the artist and, to, and do know, a dance. <laughs> exactly. That's kind of it's. It's just evolved. Everything. Yeah. You know, everything's evolving in the digital space. Our whole world is. You know, it's it's and that's music's no different. It's just it's a constant. It's constantly moving in that direction. Um, and so I still think you know. There's also that segment of folks out there, especially for rock music, that like to buy physical product. They like to buy vinyl. They like to buy CDs. They like to buy cassettes, believe it or not. Yeah. So you still make that stuff available, but you got to have two strategies. You got to have physical. How are we going to sell physical? Who are we selling it to? And now with you know Jim's partnership with CPI, we can pretty much get physical product anywhere. <clears throat> um, and then digitally, what's our digital strategy? You know, how are we going to get followers on Spotify? Um, you know, how are we going to get our, our music in front of folks on the digital platforms? You know, that's, those, those are the challenges with each release and each release is different, you know, cause some artists are more established than others. Um, some, some artists music are, is more accessible than others. So it's just like anything, you know, we try to put a specialized marketing plan together for every release. You know, some now, more than others. For, for new artists, what, what do you look for in a new artist? Um, and then how many a, a, a year are you looking to bring you on to the label? So um, <clears throat> I've recently signed, in the last few months, I've signed three artists. Um, and they're all over the place. One is um, brand new band, never put anything out. Um, their first EP just came out last Friday. Um, so they're like, trying to cultivate and build a new audience and they're a metal band so metal metal folks are loyal so i think so far so good they're off to a good start they're called darkening skies um there's another band i sign we haven't officially announced it yet but they are one of the original hardcore punk bands out of new york city so they're not only established they're legends um and a lot of their catalog has been out of print for many years. So Jib is going to start reissuing old releases with, with uh, you know, the thought in mind that they are, they have been working on new material. So eventually they will release new material too. And another band I sign um, is a new band technically, but uh, their album they recorded uh, years ago, they just never released it. 
And there are some pretty well-established artists in this band who've had success in other bands. Um, so people would recognize these names too, but we haven't made that official announcement yet either. So I'll just keep it as it is. But, but so, so I'm, I look to sign bands that I think would fit the jib mold that either jib could either help them get started like in darkening skies case or these more established bands have a need that we could fill you know that that um you know there's something that they would need our support for where it makes sense to partner with the label mm -hmm. um and so and everything in between so you know, jib is now pretty diverse in its artists there's everybody's I seasoned musicians, but in terms of where they are in their actual careers, it's, it's all over the spectrum. Now, would you ever sign an artist that was kind of outside of the jib, um, realm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I played guitar and bass on two tracks for a young lady who, uh, 18 years old. Um, it's her first, First song, first song written and recorded, and they're really good. Um, uh, one of my the bands on my label, uh, Hostel Amish, uh, their drummer has been helping her out and kind of producing the project. Um, so something like that would be completely outside the box for Jim Machine. Um, we do have a, a hardcore gangster rapper that's been on the label for years too. It goes by the name of Jesus. Um, so he's, he's, uh, that's like outside the box from our normal, um, I guess just the type of type of band that would be on gym machine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, anything, I think anything that if, if the person's old, um, in most of the bands on the label, I've had previous relationships with the people uh, just recently, um, has it been to where. I'm, I'm signing bands that I'm like becoming friends with them as I'm signing them. Most of the mm. bands up until a couple of years ago, I had known the folks for a while. And then it was like, Hey, why don't you, why don't you put an album out on jib or, you know, something like that. But, um, but the lab it's, again, it's been part of the natural, natural progression of the label. Um, last couple of years, I focused more on the business of it and it's, it's starting to show and pan out, which, you know, considering some of the things that have happened, especially over the past year during the pandemic. Um, I don't think, I don't think if, I don't think if we were in lockdown, some of the things might not have happened because people wouldn't have been available if they were living their normal lives. Um, yeah. So in a way, in a way, again, it comes back to that silver lining, you know, trying to find, <laughs> trying to find a positive in what was happening. I, I think I was successfully able to do that with, a, with, little bit of luck and perseverance um but uh we'll see how things go from here based on some of the things that have, have taken place over the last couple of years now whenever i think of a label and an artist I, I one thing i don't think about is a good relationship i feel like they're always fighting is that a, what a good is that a competitive advantage for you and jib is that you are friends and you have that relationship um i grew up this is a business podcast. I grew up in a family business. My grandfather owned a grocery store for 35 years. Um, my whole family worked there at some point in time. Um, <laughs> I, I was my first job when I was 15, uh, bagging groceries, you know, and I watched that everyone really loved my grandfather because he was a cool guy and he built these relationships with people, his customers, mm -hmm. and they were loyal. And I think, and, and his staff was loyal. And the people that worked there outside of our family worked there their whole careers. And I think that's a good model to have. Win-win um, is always the best approach. Uh, I have no desire to argue with people because it's, it's counterproductive. And, and, and then if we're, at odds with each other, then neither one of us are making money either. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's in everybody's best interest to, you know, have a win-win relationship, um, you know, work with people that have your same vision and values. And, you know, hopefully you, you put something together and it, and it works. Um, yeah. I know there's always been a kind of a <laughs> contentious relationship, but I also, I also sign people for being, I'm an indie label. I'm not a, a corporate label, so to speak, meaning, I mean, I signed someone based on them 
Like I'm not going to sign someone and go, okay, you're on my label now. Now here's what you're going to do. You're going to do this song and you're going to write this song. I mean, screw that. That's why would I sign? Why would I even do that? Like it's you come, if I see potential or stuff that I really like, then you just do your thing and we'll figure out a way to build a plan around it and make us both successful. I think mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the way to approach it. I, I agree. Exactly. Maybe it's a competitive advantage. Maybe it's not. That's just my philosophy. Um, you know, what, what does the competition from the indie label side look like? Are you going against other uh, labels in, a, you know, Cleveland or is it, you know, globally? What's it, what's that look like? I don't really look at it as competition. I think there's opportunity for everyone. Mm-hmm. And what differentiates the label aside from, you know, whatever your branding is and your business philosophy, as I just spoke about, but ultimately who are your artists? I mean, your product basically, right? I mean, that's what's going to determine whether your label's successful or not is, you know, are, are your artists making good music that people are getting into? And are you, do, and, and are you meaning me, doing a good enough job getting that music in front of people? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, promoting it the best way we can, whether it's through press, interviews like this, whether it's, you know, social media um, or what, ha- what have you. Um, that's, yeah, I think that's, that's what it comes down to. Okay. Um, as we kind of start to wrap up, what are some of the next steps for Jib and, and yourself? Well, we keep working the plan. Um, you know, we've got this, this really good partnership with CPI in place. We have a full slate of music coming out this year. Um, Slam and Gladys, their album two was the first major release this year. It came out last month. It's doing pretty well. Like I said, Darkening Skies came out last week. Um, have an artist, David Curtis, who's on, on the label, is a good friend of mine. He just released an album today called Keysum Levitations, which is actually a lot of the sweetener uh, music that's under the bed of music that's mixed underneath his tracks. Um, so it's the first, he's got a few releases lined up for this year. So this will be the first of many. And then we've got, uh, I referenced the Mike Onesco guitar army album, Eli Fletcher, who's been on the label forever has a new album coming out. Hostile Amish have been on the label since 2006. They have a seven inch coming out, which will actually be Jib's first vinyl record. Um, we've only done digital CDs and cassettes up to this point. So this will be our first uh, venture into vinyl. Uh, My solo album, as I said, and then these other artists that we signed that we'll we'll announce here soon enough. So uh, full plate doing that. um, And then just continue to build our brand and build our partnerships with, we're also looking to partner with like-minded businesses. You know, if there's apparel companies that want to do stuff with us, or we're looking at, um, partnering with some skateboard companies as well yeah. uh, for various reasons. Uh, so that, so, you know, looking to expand our partnerships, um, getting as much exposure for our artists as possible um, and just, you know, strengthening the brand as much as we possibly can. My favorite question to ask all my guests is what is something that you wish you knew uh, before you started the label? And then what is your greatest accomplishment? Wow. What do I wish I knew when I started the label? <laughs> That's a That's, good question. It's always, it's, everyone has to take a pause for that one. So <laughs> it is a good question. Um, I'm still learning about the music business. So since, since, I mean, I was, I was running the label the best I could for what I knew for a long time. Um, but it, you know, as things continue to change, you have to adapt with it. And, Learn, I th- think the past year working with CPI, my eyes have been open to a lot of things. Um, so I wish I would have had that knowledge 15 years ago, yeah. <laughs> instead of just now recently. But, but I mean, you know, in due time, I also may not have appreciated it or un- understood it as much uh, 15 years ago as I do now. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Greatest uh, accomplishment. With Jib Machine? Yes. Man. I'd say just being around this long, Um, (laughs) you know, when I read the first conversation with Clay uh, who owns CPI, um, we were originally, uh, we were connected through a person uh, that's been in the business as well. That's, that's based out of Philadelphia. He's introduced us. And um, 
it was originally just to talk about distributing the Slam and Gladys album that I just referenced that came out um, last month. And then through the conversation, he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you have this label, you're based in Cleveland, 10 minutes up the road from me. You have over 80 releases and you're still, he goes, you're still doing this all yourself. How did we not know each other? You know, so he was surprised of the longevity of just doing things myself. Yeah. You know, very DIY yeah, that I'm still doing it. So I think that, that <laughs> I do it because I love it though. Yeah. I mean, I love music. Um, you know, I'm proud of the brand that we built and the history that this label built. And the cool thing is, is even after 17 years, I feel like we're just getting started. We really are. Like the, this, this past year has really started a new phase of the label. We've probably gone through about three of them over time. This is the, this is a new one. This is a new window that's open that we're going through. So I'm excited to see where it takes us and uh, how this all ends up. Perfect. Um, how can people find you, contact you, uh, find the website and then sure. you know, of, of the artist? Um, you could email us at jibmachine at gmail. If you ever have any questions, our website is jibmachinerecords.com um, or jibdistro.com. We are currently building a new website. So hopefully that's going to be launched by the summer. I've been working on that um, with a friend of mine in Germany the past uh, few weeks. Um, you could also, we have a, we have a, uh, band camp page that has a number of releases, which you can get to by going to jibdigital.com. Um, I think that's it. Well, beautiful. That was great. That's John Templeman of Jib Machine Records. Thanks for coming on. That was great. Steven, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and, uh, and your support.